Thanks for having me. I got here at 8, and it turns out the bar doesn't open until noon, so we got some time to go. So, before I get started, if I could just get a quick show of hands, get the lay of the room here. Uh, raise your hand if you're a high school coach in the room. That's usually most people. Yeah, awesome. Great. College coaches? Any college coaches in the room? Okay, cool. Great. Um, so I'm originally from New Jersey, as Coach mentioned, and I like doing these things. You know, I've been really lucky in my career. I played my college ball out in New Jersey at a school called Monmouth University, uh, and then I was lucky enough to be in the right place at the right time after I graduated to get my first job in coaching at Princeton, where I worked for an unbelievable staff. Bob Serace is still the head coach there. Sean Gleason was the offensive coordinator who went on to call the plays at Oklahoma State, and most recently Rutgers. Um, Andy Oryk, some of you guys might know Andy. His dad was a longtime high school coach in the state. Andy's from St. Paul, I believe. He was the offensive line coach. So I was really fortunate when I was young to be taught by guys who were a lot smarter than me. And I was really lucky that they took the time to teach me and any chance to pass some of that on, I'm really grateful for. If you're not familiar with Carleton, I've been at Carleton since 2020. Uh, Carleton's right down in Northfield, Minnesota. Carleton, for all intents and purposes, is an Ivy League school. This is the number six school in the country. This is a Princeton, this is a Harvard, this is a Yale. So for all the high school coaches in the room, if you have guys with those sort of grades, if you have people who are in the top 10% of their class, if you have people who are 30 and above on the ACT, 1300 and above on the SAT, they don't have to go all the way out to the East Coast if they want an Ivy League education. They can get one in the MIAC. They can get one down at Carleton. We had five guys this year who during training camp were negotiating six-figure first jobs. So if you have guys who fit that mold, send them to us. We want to get more Minnesota kids. We don't have a ton of Minnesota kids right now. We'd love to recruit more Minnesota kids and not have to spend so much money on flights. Um, before our head coach currently got there, so our head coach is a guy named Tom Jernell. If you're not familiar with Carlton's history, Coach Jernell got there in 2018. And before he did, things weren't good. The program was 4-36 and 36 in the four years prior to him getting there, culminating in an 0-10 year, and it wasn't a particularly competitive 0-10 as they usually aren't. And so Coach got there in 2018, and through a lot of recruiting, and through a lot of hard work, and through basically sheer force of will, he's managed to turn it around. And we've put together the winningest stretch since the 1980s at Carleton, and we've had a lot of success both as a team and offensively. We were the highest scoring offense in the 100 plus year history of Carleton football this year. Last year, we were the second highest scoring offense. And we were the fourth fastest tempo team in the country. Now we use plays per game as a tempo measurement. I know there's a lot of analytics and stuff people like to use um, to figure out who's the fastest team out there. We use plays per game. Our goal is to run a lot of plays. That's why we go fast. And so what better way to measure that than plays per game. So in all of college football, Division I, II, and III, we were fifth. Texas Tech was ahead of us at the Division I level. Um, in Division III, we were fourth. So that's how we play football. And this is how it looks. If you just follow the ball here, I'm not going to talk too much about the mechanics just yet. We'll get into that in a second. I just want you to know what you're going to be looking at and the pace of play we want to play with. This is up at Concordia. Um, coach Backens here in the back of the room. Good to see you, Coach. These guys do an awesome job on defense, really, really well coached on defense, physical, tough. And so one of the only counterattacks we had was to go fast. And you can see the tempo we want to play at, right? We want to get moving, man. We want to snap the ball within four seconds, maybe five seconds of the ref putting it down. Catching people in subs, trying to tire people out. This is from a different game down in the red zone here. Again, just giving you an idea of the sort of pace we want to play with. And this is not a little package. It's not like we do this sometimes. We want to do this for 60 minutes. We hate touchdowns, so we're going to snap the ball again. You can see how quickly guys are getting lined up. <clears throat> 
right? So that's the pace with which we want to play. Now do me a favor, we raised our hands before for all the guys in the room, college, high school, whatever. Raise your hand if you're an offensive coach in the room, please. Okay, awesome. Now keep your hand up if you're a no huddle operation on offense. Okay, so a lot of you guys aren't, that's fine. Um, there's a difference between being no huddle and being up tempo. Neither one's better or worse. I've been in both. You can score a lot of points and win a lot of games doing it either way. You can do it huddling, whatever works for your program. This is what works for us. If you're not a no huddle team, if you don't want to be an up tempo team, bless you. I hope you can still find something you can take from this presentation. We believe in going up tempo. The way you can tell if you're an up tempo offense or just a no huddle offense is ask yourself this question seriously. Would the defensive coordinators in my league say we go fast? Or would they say, yeah, you know, they're no huddle, but they don't really. All right, that's how you can tell. I'd like to believe, and Coach, maybe you can enlighten me, I'd like to believe that the defensive guys in our league think we go pretty fast. Is that accurate? Absolutely. Awesome. We don't go fast. We are not an up-tempo operation because we think it's cool and fun, though it is. We don't go fast even necessarily because we think it's a competitive advantage, though we think it is. We are not in the tempo business at Carlton. We are in the consistency business. It reminds me of a quote about the founder of McDonald's who said they're not in the hamburger business, they're in the real estate business. We are not in the tempo business. Our goal is not to go fast. Our goal is to execute consistently. And the way we accomplish that is by going fast. But the number one goal we have in our program is getting our players to be consistent. And every time we snap the ball, having some sort of realistic expectation of what that's going to look like. And I think and I hope that that's true in your guys' program as well. Well, before we get them to be consistent, this is something our head coach is huge on and he's absolutely right to be. Before we get them to be consistent, it's our job to get them comfortable and confident. We call it the three C's at Carleton. So we have to get guys comfortable and confident. The first thing they need to be is comfortable. They need to be comfortable with their surroundings. If you're a position coach, it's important that the kids like being around you. You don't have to be their friend. There's a difference there. But they shouldn't dread coming to meetings. They shouldn't dread going to practice. It's important that they're comfortable in their surroundings. It's important that they're comfortable with the terminology. It's important that they're comfortable with the scheme. And then once they're comfortable, they can start getting confident. And it's our job to help make them confident. I think a lot of times we misinterpret that. And we think of confidence as something people have or they don't have. Confidence isn't something you have. Confidence is something that we can give you or we can take away. Confidence is a feeling. And we can create that as coaches. We can very easily take that away as coaches. <clears throat> the easiest way to get guys confident is to give guys reps. Doing it over and over and over and over and over again. And then seeing themselves on film. Doing it maybe poorly. And then the next day doing it a little better. And then seeing themselves fail. And then seeing themselves do it a little better. Over and over and over and over and over again. Well, the easiest way to do all that, to get guys a bunch of reps so they can be comfortable and confident and consistent, is to not run that much. Which I think everybody in here knows. The more you run, generally the worse you are at it. So the question we had to wrestle with, especially at the college level and probably at the high school level too, is how do you limit what you do on offense without being predictable and boring and quite frankly bad. The answer for us was tempo. Tempo is a vehicle for us to accomplish those three things. Getting guys comfortable, confident, and consistent. We want to go fast so that we can do those three things. That's our goal. That's our business, is consistency. It's making our meetings better. It's making our practices better. It's making our game plans better. That's why we go fast. This year, because we went fast, it simplified our meetings. 70% of our offense came on five schemes. Over 50% of our offense came on two schemes because we can disregard tendency to a certain degree. I don't have to worry so much about what our tendencies are because the coaches on the other sideline are going to know it. I guarantee that coaches on other teams have us broken down to a T. I would, be, first of all, because there's really good coaches in this league, but also we don't do that much. 
I bet they've got us broken down to a T, but by the time they can communicate that to their kids, the ball's getting snapped. It's like um, the hierarchy of needs, right? Maslow's deal. If you, if you don't have food and water, you don't really give a damn about self-actualization. Well, if you don't know your own call and your own alignment and your own job as a defensive player, you don't care about what the back's relationship to the tight end means for tendency on third and six. And I don't know if kids ever really process that stuff anyway, but certainly with tempo, it makes it difficult to process. Tempo made our practices better. We ran over 1,000 plays in fall camp. We run about 12 plays in a five-minute period, so about 24 plays in a 10-minute period. Think about the reps you can get. Think about the film you can get. Think about how many more at-bats we get throughout a week than our opponents do. And then it made our game plans better because we can disregard tendency largely. And if you do the math on a game plan, and I would encourage you guys all to do this, and your numbers will look a little different from ours, especially if you're not a tempo team, we want to run about 90 plays a game. That's where we'd like to be. Well, you're going to have 20 situationals for us. When we look back at the last two years, we've had about 20 situationals a game, meaning uh, third and fourth and short, low red zone, that kind of stuff. And I'm certainly not the first person to do this math. We have three one-word run plays in our offense. We like them. We think they're good. They are not the secret to going fast. So if you're looking for some fancy way to make everything a one-word call in order to go fast, that's not the secret sauce. We have three one-word run plays. I'm going to call them each about twice a quarter, so that's about 24 times a game. So I can take those out because I know I'm going to call them. I don't need to game plan that. That's happening. We have three, sometimes four other one-words that will run about eight times a game. Okay, so I can take those out. I know I'm going to call them. And then you're going to get about 12 drives a game in college football. I don't know exactly what the number is for high school. Uh, I know the clock's a little shorter, so I would imagine it's a little less probably 10 if I had to venture a guess, but we have our 12 drive starters that we're going to game plan. So if you take all that stuff out, for regular downs, we need to come up with about 26 calls. We only run 13 plays, and I'm going to call everything twice. So I need the best version, one best version of each of those calls going into a week. That'll shorten your game plan meetings right there. That'll shorten your install meetings. We get to spend time on stuff that can actually help our kids in meetings. I get to spend time talking about, hey, here's this guy's favorite pass rush move. Hey, when this guy's got this hand down, here's what it means. Hey, when this guy starts cheating this way, here's what it means. Because I don't have to spend 40 minutes on, hey, here's this new motion and new scheme or whatever we're putting in this week. I'm just finding, hey, what's the best version of Y cross to run this week? Hey, what's the best version of four verticals to run this week? And then the kids have done it a thousand plus times in fall camp already, and it starts to build on itself. And so they can be comfortable, and they can be confident, and they can be consistent. Any questions on this stuff? Oh, how is the conditioning for athletes? Happens in practice. We don't run. We don't run after practice. We don't do wind sprints. We don't need to. When you're ripping off 24 plays in 10 minutes, kids are tired. And we leave guys in during practice for six straight plays. We go and most people do it in threes, some people do it in fours. Our groups stay up for six plays because they got to get used to handling that tempo. Because right? you might be on the field for 12 straight plays in a game. And if there's no timeouts or injuries or deep balls or fourth and ones, we're probably not going to sub. All right? And that's understood if you're playing in this offense. We were just down at Colorado actually as a staff. We know a guy there and so we were able to sit in on some other meetings. And their OC had a really good line that I liked. He said, it's a lifestyle to be a skill player in this offense. And so they've got to embrace that. Yeah. But the conditioning happens pretty naturally. OK. So how do we do it? And hopefully there's some things here that you guys can take to. That's the why we do it. We do it because we want to be comfortable and confident and consistent. How we do it. There's two types of plays in football, the way we look at it. There's dead ball plays and there's live ball plays. So a dead ball play is a play where no matter how badly you might want to, you can't go fast. That's injuries, that's the play after a timeout, that's P and 10, that's a long ball out of bounds when we gotta go get the ball and bring it back, and there's just certain plays where you can't go fast. That's a dead ball play. On a live ball play, where we can go fast, we have the capability of going fast, 
There are three guys, not three guys, three things that are going to disrupt your tempo. We call this winning between the snaps. And we film between the snaps in games and in practice. We coach guys up between the snaps and how they're operating between each play, not just during the play. Because there's three areas that it's really important to master. The refs, recognition, and alignment. And it starts with the refs. We know some coaches, obviously none of them work at Carleton because we would never say anything like this, but there are some coaches out there who say that all refs are bad and some are worse. Well, refs have no incentive whatsoever to help you go faster as an offense. They don't get more money if you go faster as an offense. They don't get out of there quicker if you go faster as an offense. It doesn't make their job or life any better or easier to go fast. They have absolutely no incentive to help you. So we want to take them out of the equation. We are never going to give them the football. We rep ball mechanics, as we call it, like they're a scheme. We film between the snaps. We have guys at practice. Coach Lee, who's our defensive line coach, is one of them. We have two designated guys, him and our DB coach, who when the offense is up at practice, they're the refs. Okay, coach Lee is our side judge. Coach Erickson, who coaches our DB, is the ump. And so we practice this stuff like it's scheme. Don't ever give the ball to anybody on the sideline. The moment you hand the ball to somebody on the sideline, an official, a ball boy, whoever, the first thing they're going to do is put it down on the ground, which is bad enough already because it's Minnesota. It might be wet. It might be muddy. That's already a loss for us. But also, they're going to put it down. They're going to line up. Then they're going to take it, right? They're going to throw it into the umpire in the middle of the field. He's going to drop it. Some defensive lineman's going to kick it. And 17 seconds later, we finally get it spotted. We're going to take that out of the equation. We're going to get the ball back into the middle. We'll bring it to the umpire. And we do it with sort of a conveyor belt system. So outside players should give the ball to inside players who should give the ball to the O-line or the ump. I don't want outside receivers running the ball back into the middle. Sometimes it happens out of necessity. You're the only guy on that side of the field. You've got to hustle it in and hustle back out. I'd rather see a slot receiver or a tight end or a running back go get the ball from the outside guy and bring it back in. Because it's easier, if I'm a tight end, for me to give the ball to the umpire, who's right where the center is going to be, and then get lined up, I've got to run like six yards. If I'm an outside receiver, and I've got to hand it to the umpire and then run all the way out to the numbers, that's a lot further. So we wanted to get the ball in with a relay system like that. Do you ever find refs not do that? Do you not do yes. Play? Yep. It's never, <coughs> no, that part, no. Sorry. But we have had refs tell us, and they'll come up to us pregame. We have all these conversations pregame. We have had refs tell us in pretty blunt terms at times that, like, we are not going to spot the ball before X seconds on the play clock, which we've looked it up. There's no rule that says that they can't spot it before a certain time on the play clock. Um, that's their personal preference. But I don't want to get fined by the NBA or something for talking about refs up here. Most of them are awesome. Most of them get it. They want to help you out. They want to put it down. They like the style of play. Occasionally, you run into a guy who's like, I'm not doing it. I'm going to wait. I'm going to let my guys get set. And you'll see that pop up on film sometimes. So this is how that looks in practice. Again, we practice it like it's scheme. We rep this every single day. You can look at the grass and the trees. This is late in the year. We've been doing this for 10 weeks already. And we're going to rep it every single day. We take five minutes out of our day to rep this stuff. Backup quarterbacks during this little on-air period, they act as the umpire. And you can see we're going to get that ball into them. Guys are going to get lined up. We get it spotted. I'll get into the formations and all that stuff in a second here. I want to just talk about the ball mechanics right now. We're off and running. Throw catch. You can see the receiver down here as the football. He's going to bring it back in. I love this. See the tight end right here? He's coming to get it from the receiver because he lines up closer to the ball, so his alignment's easier. We talk about handing it to the ref. I'm okay with a short toss. I don't want anybody throwing it. If it's a short little toss from me to you, coach, that's fine. What we tell the guys who act as officials in practice for us, so the backup quarterbacks, sometimes coaches, is if somebody throws it to you from far away, make no attempt whatsoever to catch it because the ref's not going to catch it in the game. And we tell Coach Lee on the sideline that, first of all, he should be berating the guys to hand them the ball. And if they do, throw it 50 feet over the umpire's head because that's what the ref's going to do in the game. So we will always bring it in. I'm good with a short toss. We don't want to see a long toss. And we practice this every day. This is like 
If you're an air raid team who does settle and noose every day, this is that. If you're an option team who does ball handling every day, this is that for us. We rep it like it's scheme. It's an important skill set to us. And like scheme, some guys are better at it than others. And then this is how it looks in a game. So we're going to throw the slot fade at the bottom of the screen here. All right, throw catch, tackle, and then we're moving. Okay, we're moving. Watch down here. He's hidden by the kicking net, but watch the receiver who caught the ball here. He's not going to give it to this umpire or this uh, official. He's going to run it in. He's going to run it in, and he puts it down for him. You know where the ball is going to get snapped. Find the line judge. Find the hash. That's where the ball is going to get snapped. Put the ball there. Do the work for them. I wish he wouldn't have put it on the ground because then it could get kicked. I'd prefer he hand it to an offensive lineman, and then they'll give it to the, to the ref. Ref puts it down, and we're moving. All right, and then we're right back into it. Same thing here. We're going to throw a hitch to the bottom of the screen. Okay, we're in 12 personnel here, throwing that to one of our tight ends. And then you can see number two here. He's not helping his teammate up. He's getting the ball. You got to get up on your own time, man. This is life in the fast lane. He's going to get it into the ref. Ref puts it down. And we're going to get that thing snapped against one of the best D-lines in the league, in my opinion. And we're able to make some yards. We didn't make a ton of yards against them, but made some yards because of the tempo. Catch guys just getting their hand in the ground. Long run down the sideline here. This is an awesome game. If any of you guys have a chance to come see the Carlton St. Olaf game in person, it's a great crowd. It's a great environment. This is an awesome game to be at down in Northfield. Okay, so the quarterback gets tackled with the ball, and he's going to get the ball right into the ref. Everybody's already there. We're winning between the snaps. You can see the chain crew just getting ready to get lined up. Ref's out of there, and we're going to snap that thing. Okay, again here, this is a third down. We're going to throw this little stick route catch that we're going to get the ball back into the ref and we're moving fourth and three we don't care okay in fact one of our favorite things to do is to go fast on fourth down because that's when most people are going to slow down check their call sheets right they were catching them in a sub and then this was awesome this was a really validating moment this is a rivalry game for us this kid's screaming at his coaches this was a lot of fun force him into a timeout so that's the first thing you got to do. You got to take the refs out of the equation. If you just do that, if you do nothing else, if you just work on taking the refs out of the equation, you will be faster as an offense. The second thing that's important to us is recognition. That's the amount of time it takes for kids to recognize the signal, recognize the play, process what it means to them. The number one thing is practice calling plays fast. If you're a play caller in the room, that is the number one thing that will hold you back. And it has to be practiced. It's a skill set. Calling plays in general is a skill set. I, I would encourage anybody who's not doing this already to stop scripting everything in practice. Call at least a period, if not more, off the cuff in practice so that you can practice it, especially if you want to go fast. We don't script a single play during fall camp or spring ball. We call it all off the cuff so that we can go fast, so that I can practice it, because I need it. I'm not the smartest guy in the room by any means. I need that work. I need that practice. And so we don't script any of it. The other reason we don't script it is because plays don't always go the way we think they will. And I might script a play thinking we're going to you know, throw a hitch on the left side, and then I have, oh, great, I know a great play to follow that up with tempo. And then my quarterback scrambles out instead of throwing the hitch and throws the ball down the field to the right. Well, if I still want to go fast, I need a different play call ready. So that sort of stuff comes up. Uh, and then having efficient signals. We're not a one-word operation. We have some lengthy play calls that you'll see here, um, but we signal them efficiently. We get boards involved. We don't have a ton of sideline personnel. You know, we've, we've got a staff of four full-time guys, and then we'll have an injured player or something hold a board for us that we use. Um, but we find ways to be creative and efficient with the signals. So call plays fast. We're in 12 personnel here. 
We've got two tight ends and a running back at the bottom of the screen. <clears throat> We're going to throw a little bubble, catch that thing. All right, now the play is not the important part. I want you to look right now at the quarterback, the receivers, all the skill guys. They're immediately snapping their head to the sideline. This is the kind of thing we're talking about when we're watching the film with them after practice because we film between the snaps and we want to win between the snaps and we're going to coach them up between the snaps. If one of these kids wasn't looking at the sideline right now, that's something we're actively coaching them up on throughout the week and throughout camp and throughout the season. So the signals are right over here and you're going to see the ball just got tackled and it's a little tough to see, it's kind of off in the distance. But the play's already coming in. Already been called. Right? Get the play call in early. The full play call here, so you know, is left flex box Sunday trouble wolves false. Not a one word. And the ref got out of there, and we're already lined up and ready to go. Simply by calling the play fast. It was the same play we ran before, which helps a little bit. Okay, again, the play is already being signaled. If you look at the top of the screen here, I'll rewind it for you. Right now. So the kid just got tackled. Play's getting signaled. <clears throat> Yeah, yep. The O-line doesn't look at the signals for us. The quarterback tells them what they need to know. Uh, I want those guys with their eyes forward. That's really the biggest reason for it. There's already enough chaos when you go fast. There's already enough misalignments and stuff like that. So I want those guys to be able to play with their eyes up. And so that at least as the defense is getting somewhat formulated, they can see it. Is that a one word call line? This one, well, uh, usually it's one we're called, yeah, because they don't care about formations and shifts and motions and that kind of stuff. We tell them what they need to know. They don't know about 75% of the offense, and I'm good with that. We're on the move. We're going to throw catch. Okay, and then here's the quarterback right over here, and you can see if you can make it out on the film from where you're at, he's already looking back at the signal. He got the signal here. All right, there's the signal right over there. Again, a little tough to see. But then he's doing something awesome here. He's telling everybody else. He's passing it along. Because some guys might be getting tackled. They might be in a scrum. Whatever happened to them, and they don't see it. One of the great lines, again, we were just down at Colorado. Their OC is a super smart guy. And one of the great things he said that I'm going to steal is take the test together. Don't take the test alone. Take the test together. Tell your teammates a signal. Tell them something they might have missed. Ask. Ball gets spotted for us, and we're off and running. We end up dropping the, the bubble here, which was less than ideal. But. Same thing here. Okay, the full plate call here, so you know. Again, it's the, one words are not the secret to this. This is uh, right boy Wednesday, excellent trouble, wolves true. We don't carry a lot of calls that long, I want to make that clear. <laughs> we only carry a couple of those. And usually they're dead ball plays when you can't go fast anyway. But we can go fast with them. And then right here, if you look at the top of the screen again, ball got tackled. Okay, if you look right up here, first of all, 14, 22, 10, 11, everybody's eyes are on the sideline. And then here's the signal right here, already coming in. If you just call plays fast, that'll change the dynamic of your offense. But you gotta practice it. You gotta get used to it. The kids have to practice it. Okay, it's tough to see the signal here because we zoomed in, but the quarterback who went off screen snapped his eyes to the sideline and now he's taking the test together. He saw the signal, he's gonna signal it to other people. I don't care about people picking our signals. It doesn't bother me one bit because none of them are looking. None of the defense is looking at the quarterback signal right here. Because they got to figure out what their job is before they start thinking about what our jobs are. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. off and running. And then we're right back to it. Look at zero, look at 14. You've got to train their eyes. And now take the test together. Signal it to your buddies. This kid's far away. Maybe he didn't see it. Tell him. Number 12 here who caught the ball. All right, he caught the ball. He got tackled. He might not have seen the signal. As he's running by, he's telling them right here, hey, here's the play. Or, even better, just tell him his job. Hey, man, run a slant. Little play action. They cover it because these guys are good at defense. We end up scrambling around for a good play. So that's the second thing, recognition. You got to take the refs out of the equation. You've got to call the play quickly. And then the third thing is alignment. So the time between a kid recognizing the play call and getting lined up for the play call. That's another area where you lose time between the snaps. So the thing we do, most often try to do, is not make the move. Right? So there's two important things when you talk about alignment. One, they have to understand the difference between great effort and wasted movement. And there's a difference there. And this is a tough one to wrap your head around. This is a tough one to, to reckon with. This would make Vince Lombardi roll over in his grave to quote a coach much smarter than me. Because the reality of most of these plays are some of the things that we've been teaching for so long, some of the effort stuff, the kids never get there anyway. If it's outside zone to the left and I'm the right side receiver, am I ever actually going to catch that safety? Out of 100 times, I might catch him 10. And on nine of those, it won't matter anyway because the three technique made the tackle in the backfield. Right? So understanding the difference between giving great effort and knowing when the journey's over, knowing when you're just wasting movement. And so we teach our kids we want to catch that backside safety, but if he flies out of there, man, just start getting lined up for the next play because we're going to beat them over the course of time with the tempo. We're going to snap the ball 90 times. We only need five or six of them to work to score 30 points. You're going to get 90 at bats. And we don't want to tire ourselves out in an attempt to tire the defense out. And then the second thing is how flexible is your base offense? There is not a single play in our offense that can't be run out of almost any formation. We don't marry plays to formations. It's all concept-based teaching. If we can run it out of two by two, by two we can run it out of three by one. All right? And this way, we don't have to switch formations as much. You can go a lot faster if you're just willing to stay in the same formation for a couple plays in a row and not switch it up. All right? And that was something I learned the hard way. Because I remember going back and watching film my first couple years play calling, and we had a great look in a certain formation. Whether you go fast or not, I made this mistake as a, as a, as a first-time play caller, and a second time, and a third time. We'd be in a formation with a great look, and then I would change the formation because you got all this cool stuff on your call sheet that you want to call. And it's like, no, we had them in the look. We had them in the look to stay in it. Don't change it. Well, that's been really helpful for tempo, too. And I think it's helpful whether you go fast or not. So I want you to watch these two guys down here talking about alignment, these two receivers here, because we're going to run about six or seven plays here. This is on homecoming for us. Uh, and they're not going to move practically the entire time. We're willing to leave them in that same formation because we can still run the whole offense out of it. So we're going to run a little Y cross here. We end up checking it down. Okay. Look at the sideline. Let's tie it all together here. Okay, this kid gets tackled. I think he actually hands the ball to the ref on the sideline this play, so that's not good. But the moment he crosses the first down marker, the signal's down here. It's a little tough to see. The moment he crosses the first down marker, play's getting signaled before he's even tackled. Yeah, he handed it to the side judge there. Not good. Refs do a good job there getting it in for us. Again, they're usually very accommodating with it. Every once in a while, you run into a guy who doesn't like it and doesn't want to be a part of it. Same two receivers down at the bottom of the screen. I'm just going to let it run. Now there is some confusion because the first kid handed it to the side judge, the second kid didn't. Now they're relaying a ball in. Same two kids, same spot. They haven't had to move. We're not making them run all the way across the field. This kid hasn't had to move up top. 
Tight ends, yeah, we'll make them move because they don't have to cover as much ground. Running backs, sure, you're flipping from one side of the quarterback to the other. We try and leave the receivers in place as much as we can. If for no other reason than to save running on their legs. If you're a small school and you don't have an army of receivers you can roll out there and you've got to save some running on their legs, this is a great way to do it. Are you willing to stay in the same formation? Are you willing to keep them where they are? And can you still run your offense that way? Or do they have to run a mile back and forth throughout the course of a game from one sideline to the other? Same kids, same spot. Same ball mechanics. Same call on the play fast. Run the ball in. Get it to the official. Same kids, same spots. One of the other great things, if you're not an RPO operation, we are an RPO operation. If you want to run RPOs and be fast, one of the great things about it is it keeps guys in the same spot. They don't have to run all the way across the field trying to chase somebody down for a block. They can just bubble, and now they're right where they needed to be. It's a little less running for them on plays where you'd like to take something off their legs. And I'm not going to take credit for this. This is just a good football player being good at football. But that whole drive, those two kids got to stay in practically the exact same spot. This is another example here. Watch the kids up top. Ironically, it's the same two kids. <clears throat> You can see skill players' eyes snap into the sideline. The play's already been signaled in. Okay, they're right there. This kid had to run all the way back across, and that stinks. But that was his own fault. This was actually a play where he could have stayed there if he wanted to. There's no franticness. I hope you guys see that on the film, too. There's no franticness in this style of offense. I think people think that a lot, that if you're an up-tempo offense, your kids are going to get tired because you're just sprinting to get lined up. I mean, look at these two guys. Their eyes on the sideline, they get it. They're on a light jog and a walk to get lined up. If you're efficient between the snaps, if you win between the snaps, if you get the ball in quickly, and you call the play fast, and you save them some trouble on the alignment, you're going to save your guys' energy. You're going to save them running. Every once in a while, you got to hustle. 80 is going to have to run all the way across the field here. That's life in the fast lane. This sort of motion can be fun, too, on a different topic if you're playing a man-to-man -man team. You get the Mike linebacker running into the motion guy here. Watch this. These guys are another team that does an awesome job on defense. Play's already called. Play's already been signaled. We'll catch him in a sub. All right, these three guys here, leave them where they're at. Let them stay there. What's your like? Great question. Yeah, great question. Um, <clears throat> you can get the lights back there, please. Mm -hmm. So, indie periods. Indie periods, if you want to run this style of offense, and maybe you do, maybe you don't, you have to take stuff off them. In the periods, we don't grind the guys. Because when we're in team periods, especially during training camp, they're going to grind. They're going to be in there for 24 plays in 10 minutes. They might run 80 plays a day in practice. Um, now, not all 80 plays are the same. If I ran 25 back out bubbles in an 80 play day, that's not really that task. Um, but in the periods, we're not running them hard. We're doing with receivers, receivers especially, because that's the position that suffers because they run so much. You'll get a lot of hamstrings if you want to run guys on wind sprints during Indy and run this style of offense. You've got to be cognizant of that. So top of wrap stuff, ball drills, you know, those sorts of things. Releases, things where they don't have to cover a lot of space. Um, 
Linemen, it's a little easier because they don't cover a ton of ground in Indy anyway, but you don't want them straining super hard in their Indy periods. You know, you don't want them for 25 minutes hitting five minutes left because they're going to go run 24 plays in the next team period. Um, so focusing on footwork, focusing on that kind of stuff. Uh, quarterbacks, the quarterback Indy, you can pretty much do what you've always done, you know, assuming you don't run laps for quarterback Indy. Uh, tight ends, same idea, depending on where you put them. If they're with the linemen, then they're going to be linemen in me. If they're with the receivers, then they're going to work the receiver stuff. Running backs, too. So that's that's an important part of it. It's a good question. you got to take some stuff off them. Yeah. Any other questions? That's pretty much the whole video. Uh, you, you talked about limiting your plays. You can run out of two by two. Or three yeah. Two yep. Do you provide, you know, um, flexibility when you're calling a certain play to the receivers where to line up? On some of them, yeah, on some of them. Um, especially the one word stuff, you know, because the one word stuff is like, it's all tempo, or it's all uh, concept based. And a lot of our one word stuff is just line up where you can, you know, wherever you can get lined up the quickest and then you know what spot on the field you have to get to. There's certain plays that aren't like that, right? If we're running uh, slant arrow, I don't want the arrow coming from the other side of the field. Though it could, um, but yeah, yeah, absolutely, they do get some flexibility. And then uh, mm -hmm. follow up. Let's say you're taking a shot. Now. Yeah. Incomplete ball. Mm -hmm. Do you have the receiver then grab the ball from the far end of the field, and run it back? And He'll be out after that play. You, you, and then yeah. Pull now we we pull him out. Yeah, that's a way that. So in practice, okay. And again, this is something that you just got to go over with the kids and teach them and coach them on. And it's something that we talk about when we film between the snaps is if there's a long ball out of bounds, we leave the camera rolling, and if that kid gets it, brings it back in, and lines up the next play, somebody's wrong. Because if you have to go chase a long ball out of bounds, there should be a receiver on the sideline who's locked into practice, who's ready to sub in for you. So that you don't have to do that, and so we don't have to screw up the tempo in practice. In a game, you're gonna go get it, right? Same deal. Shot plays for us in a game, as much as we wanna hit them, sometimes they're also just a chance to change personnel. Sometimes we'll call a P and 10 shot play because if we complete it, great. And if we don't complete it, it's a chance to exit because we can't go fast to the next play anyway. So we've got to go chase this long ball. So it's a chance for me to then, okay, let's get 12 personnel in the game. Okay, let's you know make the substitution that I wanted to make that we weren't making because we were going fast. So you find your spots for those. And I don't know if, you know, I, I definitely don't call enough shot plays as it is. And so it's another thing that encourages me to call some shot plays, is that it's a chance to take a deep breath and look at my call sheet for once and, and uh, change personnel and all that. But in practice, guys should be ready to sub in. Same thing if we break a big run, anything like that. Yep. We don't want to penalize guys in practice for doing well. Like if you're giving great effort and going to get a deep ball, and I call a one word call the next play, I don't want to disincentivize that effort. I don't want you to think to yourself, I'm not going to get that ball. I got to get lined up for the next play. You know, I don't want a running back thinking, I'm not going to finish this run. I got to get back and get lined up for the next play. Or a quarterback saying, I don't want to carry out this fake. I got to get back to the next play. So we don't want to incent or disincentivize that kind of effort. So if you give great effort, somebody else will step in for you, and you can get in the next play after that. And I, I, to be honest with you, I would practice that way if we were up tempo or not. Yeah. Any other questions? What's your cadence? Uh, our center actually calls the cadence. So the quarterback will clap when he's ready. When he's seen everything that he needs, he'll clap, and then the center will call the cadence for us. How do you do that? Uh, so if there's a motion, we have a code word that we give the center, and that tells him to just snap it on the clap. Yeah, so the quarterback will communicate that free snap. He'll just say whatever our code word for is it. You know, Monday, Monday, whatever it is, that's not it. Anybody's in our league is watching. <laughs> <laughs> Coach, I see you back there. Um, so, hey, Monday, Monday. And that, then they know to snap on the clap. That's another thing. Tempo team, not tempo team. If you're a shotgun team, if I have my say about it, we'll never go back to the, to the center not calling the games. Because I've been here three years. In practice and in games, I can count the number of bad snaps we've had on one hand. And I don't mean over his head. We've never had one over his head. <coughs> I mean a snap out here or up here. I can count them on one hand. And I think it's largely because the center can anticipate his own snap. Now that has some drawbacks too. 
right? Those tackles are almost always a half second late off the ball for us because the center anticipates his own snap count. Um, that just doesn't bother me as much because we're not a huge drop back team. And so if, you know, it's like, ah, I'll get beat by speed rushers. It's like, well, they're probably going to get beat by speed rushers anyway. Have you seen St. John's? <laughs> <laughs> so at least it gives the center a better chance. Um, you talked about earlier before the session, you talked about trying different things and how that didn't work. And so yeah. you tried something else. Um, and in everything, there's, there's benefits and then there's costs to mm -hmm. What are you giving up as a result of running this? Yeah. Uh, I think what you're always wrestling with if you run this style of offense is efficiency versus explosiveness. And if you want to go fast, you have to lean towards efficiency. Because if we throw a deep ball out of bounds, we can't follow it up by going fast. That has hurt us because there are some really good teams in our league. And there are teams that you're just not, I don't care who you are, you're not going to sustain a 12 play drive against them. You know, when Bethel and St. John's play each other, they don't have 12 play drives, and they're both really good. Um, when Gustavus is playing Augsburg, they don't have 12 play drives, and they're both really good. So you have to be able to score with some explosiveness. We have not been very explosive because we're so focused on the tempo. So that has hurt us. Now I'll take that trade off, being 7-3 and scoring 36 points a game, I'm willing to live with that. Uh, but that's definitely an area where we need to be better and finding that balance, that's been tough. I don't really believe that it hurts your formational flexibility. I think you can still line up in a bunch of different formations um, as long as you're smart and efficient with how you move the kids around. It hurts your ability to sub-personnel and so that's been something that's beneficial for us in the past, and, and it probably is at your guys' schools too. Maybe there's a kid who's really good at one thing, and you want to find a role for that kid. And that's important to us too, for morale. I don't want a kid to sit on the sideline all game. I'd like everybody to play. So if there's a kid who's got one really great skill set, I want to get him in to use that. So at least he's been in the game and contributed. We've lost that a little bit by doing this. Because if there's a certain play, they're like, hey man, this is your play, and this is all you've got to know. And if you're just a speed sweep guy, I think we've all probably got somebody who, like, he's just a speed sweep guy. It's tough for me to sub that kid in because now it's going to slow down and, and it hurts you. The way we've tried to counter that is we've tried starting drives with those plays. Use it as a P and 10 or, at, or in a dead ball. They call a timeout, there's an injury, try and do it after that. That's been our solution. It's been okay. You find other teams are slowing down their tempo. Just to I do, in fact. Yeah, Minnesota Morris, I think, slowed down the tempo a good, good bit against us. Um, most teams don't. Uh, Morris was the one that really did. Most teams kind of play the way they play. I don't know if it always shows up on film how fast we go, and this was our first year going quite this fast. So I don't know if teams really knew what to expect. Because sometimes when you're watching film, you know, you can cut it up in such a way that you don't really notice how fast the team is going on film. And when you get there, you're like, man, it's going to go pretty fast. Um, so that probably helped. Next year, I wouldn't be surprised if we saw a little more of it. Yeah. It has helped, though, too, with exotic looks. We don't see a ton of exotics. Because generally, an exotic look on defense is a longer play call. Just like an exotic play on offense is a longer play call. And you don't have time to get it signaled in. So we don't see a ton of blitz. We certainly see less than we used to. We see less twist game than we used to. We see less coverage disguises than we used to because there's just not the time to get that all communicated. And so that's been very helpful. Um, that's also been a way for us. Again, the thing I want to stress here is we don't do this because of the games. We do this because of practice. We do this because of meetings. We do this because of the way it changes the problems that it solves for your program as a whole. You can carry less offense. You can simplify your game plans. You can have more efficient meetings and more efficient practices. Well, one of the ways that's happened for us is if you're a third and four tempo, de uh, third and four exotic defense, if it's third and four, and hey man, every time we're in third and four, these guys are going to bring something. Well, our offensive line coach can spend every indie period that week working on that exotic look for that one third down that we may or may not see anyway, or 
I can just make the plan on Monday night that, you know what, if we get to third and four, we're gonna go fast and they won't call us. And then we can spend those indie periods working on something else. We can spend those indie periods working on first steps, working on aiming points, working on punches, right? We can spend those indie periods on that stuff because I can just say, ah, we'll go fast and they won't call it. Which is a great plan until you go fast and they do call it anyway. Yeah. It's been helpful. Do you feel like you have to be fast like literally fast, like like yeah. run a fast 40? No, mm -hmm. nope, nope. In fact, I don't think you need to snap the ball fast for this stuff to benefit you as an offense. Um, like the Gophers, for example, are a big check with me operation. We approach offense very differently than that. There's nothing wrong with how they approach offense. They win a bunch of games, they score a bunch of points. We, we approach it a little differently. But I think some of these things, calling the play fast, relaying the ball in, not making guys run a long way in their alignments. I think that would be awesome for a team who wants to be checked with me. The old Peyton Manning style of no huddle, where you get lined up quick just so you can dummy cadence four times and undress the defense. Um, and that way you can still keep your time of possession high. But as far as the athletes physically needing to be fast, I don't think so. I think it's a good answer if they're not, because you do catch defenses off guard. You do catch defenses out of position. You get more vanilla looks and that can be an equalizer for you if you're not very fast. The other thing I get asked a lot is, do I feel like we hurt our own defense doing this, tire out our own defense? Uh, I don't believe that. I don't believe that fast offenses make their own defenses tired. I believe that bad offenses make their own defenses tired. I don't know a defensive coach in the world who's had to go back on the field after two, three and outs and said to themselves, oh, thank God they huddled. It's still two, three naps. The defense is still going to be tired. So whatever you need to do to give yourself the best chance to make first downs and score points, that's what's going to keep your defense fresh. I've also never met a defense who, after you score a touchdown in one play, is exhausted and, and uh, pissed to be on the field the next play. You just score. They're excited. They've got energy now. So just like on offense, you know, we would never have a 12-play drive, score a touchdown, defense gets a pick on the first drive and go, oh no, we're tired, don't get a turnover. You know, that's just not how it works. So as long as you're moving the chain and scoring points, people are gonna be energized. You obviously have the areas that work with kids. Yes. Um, no, because we rep it all the time. And whether you're a 1400 SAT or a 400 SAT. If you do something every day all the time, you're gonna process it well, for the most part. Now there are certainly things we're able to do that if we were recruiting qualifiers, maybe we couldn't, that are a little bit more complicated. But I think the philosophy as a whole would still be sound. And the other thing too, if you're at a school that has really smart kids, um, or maybe you just have a couple really smart kids on your team. I think it's a mistake to tell yourself that they're really smart and so I can bog them down with a bunch of scheme. I think that's a mistake. I think it's a common mistake people make with quarterbacks. I think people look at good quarterbacks and they say, well, he's really good and he's really smart, so let me put a ton on his plate. We don't do that with other positions. You would never take an awesome three technique and say, let me make his job harder. You'd say, let me get him matched up one-on-one -on, -one on the other team's worst offensive lineman, make his job as easy as possible, and he'll go be an All-American. But for some reason, with smart kids who can handle a lot, people like to say, well, let me really bog them down here, and they'll be able to handle it. They're going to respond the same way any kid would. They're going to respond by playing a little less well. And if you take that off their plate instead, and you go, well, they're really smart, but let me still give them a simple job to go execute, they're just going to execute it at an even higher level because they're really smart. Yes, sir. If you're a uh, high school coach and you have a two way player, how would you handle that? That's the thing I really, I really struggle with. Um, that's the probably the biggest thing that could hurt you here. Because I think this is a great answer for sort of small schools. Because of all the things it can do time wise. Like, we don't have a scout team at Carlton. We don't have enough kids. We play ones on ones as a scout team. We have 70 kids on the roster, which I know is more than a lot of high schools. But this has helped us here. Because in our, instead of getting two team periods, because we've got a scout team, we get one, because the offense has one, 
and the defense has one. And so you say, okay, well, you're losing out on half the reps. No, we're not, because we go fast and we double the amount of reps we get within that time. Does that make sense? So for those, for teams who can do that, I think it's really beneficial. A kid who goes both ways is tough. Uh, I think that's really tough. I think you would have to major on one side of the ball and minor on the other. Uh, and this way, you know, he could have a package or something. He could be one of those guys on either side of the ball. But yeah, it's hard, especially alignment. I, there, honestly, a receiver having to go both ways wouldn't bother me as much. Because I can just make sure that I'm building some bubbles and hitches and stuff into that kid on offense that maybe he doesn't have to run 10 straight go balls and then he can be pressure on defense. Alignment will be hard because it's, it's grueling. That would be hard. So I don't know. I, that would give me pause for sure. If you come up with a good solution for it, I, I would love to hear it. Yeah. I think you just got to be careful with how they spend their time. Maybe they go one day here, one day the other. I don't know. Yeah. That would be the thing that would hold me up. If my best player had to play both ways, I would have some hesitation about doing this. Now, what I wouldn't have hesitation about is getting lined up fast still, but not necessarily snapping fast, and using my ability to get lined up fast as a weapon, and making a defense show their hand. I would still use that. And those advantages apply more to the not run more fast than the 100%. That's the other thing, too. Yeah, because, we, because we're very intentional about not tiring kids out between the snaps, I think that it might cancel each other out. You know, if I'm an outside receiver who's got to run all the way into a huddle and all the way out every play, that's tiring too. Um, is it as tiring as running 12 plays in five minutes? I don't know. Maybe it's not completely equal, but I don't think there's a chasm between how tiring they are. It might be six of one, half dozen of the other. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. What are your thoughts about taking that last step and turning it all over to the quarterback? I'm hesitant about that because they're smart, but they're still college kids. They got a lot of other things going on in their life. They don't live and breathe it the way we do. Now, we have great quarterbacks. They're super smart. They work hard. Uh, I'm blessed to be around some really talented quarterbacks. But there are certain things that we give them freedom on. Yeah, they have. there are certain plays that they can check and, and do that kind of stuff. Yeah, we call it, we have green light plays, yellow light plays, and red light plays. So if I'm just calling inside zone with a bubble, that would be a green light play. You can snap that thing as fast as you want. There's very little thinking. They also know when they've got a yellow light or a red light kind of play. Like if we've got a multi-level drop back pass kind of deal. I might say, hey guys, this is a red light play. If you don't snap this super fast, I'm good with it. If you want to take some time and see some stuff and you know, communicate, that's fine. So there are those nuances and some things they have control over. I don't know, that, that would be tough to turn it completely over to them. We do a little bit. I don't script seven on seven, I don't call seven on seven. The quarterbacks call seven on seven. They call their own stuff. Trying to power them a little bit. Say, coach, you got a minute. Yeah, cool. Any last questions? I hope this was helpful, guys. I hope there's something you can take away, whether you're an up-tempo team or not, uh, and help make yourselves a little bit better. So thank you very much. And if you want to come down to Carleton, we start spring ball in May, believe it or not, because we're on trimesters. So we'd love to see you guys. If you want to take down my contact info, uh, my name is Bob Davies. My cell phone number is 732-882. 3518. My email, you can find it on the school website also, is uh, bdavies at carlton.edu. So that's D A V I E S and then C A R L E T O N for Carlton. So thanks a lot, guys. Appreciate it.